Hello, this is Miss Kyler, and now I'm going to talk to you about John Milton. John Milton is probably one of my favorite writers. In fact, when I went to grad school, I specialized in John Milton. So I'm really happy. I wish we could do a lot more with um, him in the British literature class. Um, John Milton lived from 1608 to 1674, so he really lived through the Civil Wars and the restoration of the king. This is a really great timeline. It really tells you all the historical things that were going on. Um, if you want to see a bigger version of the timeline, I've included it as a, an attachment in the lesson. I know this is really tiny and hard to see, but just a little bit brief overview. Now the dark blue indicates things that Milton was doing during these times. Um, so after Henry VIII, that was you know, Wyatt, then there was Queen Elizabeth, and during Queen Elizabeth there was Shakespeare. And after um, Queen Elizabeth, um, James I came to power. And during King James I's um, reign, there was the gunpowder plot and the King James Version of the Bible. I've included a little video of the gunpowder plot in the lesson just to give you an idea of what that meant and what was going on there. Um, so Milton, if you see all these dark blue things, you see how he, um, and the dark purple too, all the different important writings, it's a dark purple. Um, you see all the things that he's doing. He's very well educated, very well traveled. His idea was it's his, you know, God has destined him to do something great for him. And so it's his job to really um, get all the tools he can to become something that God can use. And so all his life, he's trying to learn and learn and learn and learn and learn as much as he can from Hebrew, Greek, Latin, Italian, all these different languages, all these different poetry, just study, study, study. He was brilliant. Um, during the, the Civil War, that was when Cromwell, the Puritans, were fighting against the king to take over so that there would be more of a rule of the people and not just a dictator. They ended up winning and they executed King Charles I. And it was Milton was uh, assigned to do the job of explaining to all the other nations why they did that. Why did they execute the king? And so he wrote Iconoclastes basically defending that act. Um, and then, of course, when the king came back, the restoration of the king, the king was restored to the throne, not the one that was executed, but a relative of his, King Charles II, was brought back um, to rule instead, and Cromwell was in trouble. Um, of course, Milton was also in trouble. And so he actually was put into uh, under arrest, and while he was imprisoned, his blindness became much worse. And so by the time he was writing Paradise Lost, he was pretty much completely blind. And he wrote Paradise Lost, which is a huge epic. It's a gigantic epic. It's much bigger even than Beowulf. And it's all about, you know, the good versus evil of um, God versus the devil in the, in the Garden of Eden. Okay? And the whole, you know, sin entering the world um, from the, Genesis, the book of Genesis in the Bible. Okay, so he wrote that and he was blind. So basically he would speak it out loud while his daughter would write it down or other, another person that would, a uh, scribe would write it down for him. It wasn't always his daughter. Um, so he's pretty amazing. He did a lot in his life. He died in 1674. It's interesting also that he had three different wives. So, um, now the wives, he 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 would stay married to them until they died, but when they died, it was because of childbirth most of the time, because um, women at that time did not live very long because childbirth was when when a woman went to have a baby, it was pretty much a gamble: will she live? Will she not live? Because there was just not the care that they eventually had, and the ability to make sure that women did not get infections or die in childbirth. So a lot of women did. So I want to highlight two poems specifically. Milton did a lot of writing. We could look at his writing all day long and all year long and three or four years from now because I really am impressed with everything he's done. But we're going to uh, limit it to two of his poems. So this poem is called On His Being Arrived to the, to the Age of 23. And we see this picture of him here and he looks very young and probably around the time of he's 23 you know, in college. 
And he, he, he actually was made fun of a lot when he was in college because he looked so pretty. You know, a lot of the, the uh, other college boys, they go out and they carouse and go out with women. And he really strongly believed that it was a man's, that God wanted men to stay pure before marriage. And so just as women should stay pure before marriage, he thought the men should be held to the same, um, the same rules, right? And so he really felt like his job was to become a fit vessel for the Lord. So he, you know, was called many names because of his looking frail and pretty and not going out and carousing a lot. It's kind of sad. And I want to look at this poem a little bit more in depth. It's an Italian sonnet. And in the octave, he's saying, I'm already 23 and I still haven't done anything stupendous for God. But let's look at that octave. How soon hath time, the subtle thief of youth, stolen on his wing my three and twentieth year? My hasting days fly on with full career, but my late spring no bud or blossom showeth. Perhaps my semblance might deceive the truth that I to manhood am arrived so near, and inward ripeness doth much less appear that some more timely happy spirits endureth. Yet... So yet is where the volta is. There's going to be a turn. Remember the octave presents the problem, the quandary. His quandary is, oh, I haven't done anything. And people think I look so young and so pretty. Maybe I look like I'm really still a child, but I'm really a man. And I haven't done anything for the Lord yet. And then assessed it, yet, that's the volta, the change in the tone, be it less or more or soon or slow, it shall be still in strictest measure even. To that same lot, however mean or high, toward which time leads me, in the will of heaven, all is, if I have grace to use it so, as ever in my great taskmaster's eye. So he says, in the sense that the answer, the solution is, God sees all works, small and big, as equal. I just must be faithful with the talents he has given me. So first of all, one thing I want to look at is the, where he does this, How soon hath time the subtle thief of youth? So the, the subtle thief of youth, youth isn't a positive. It's a little phrase after the noun that renames the subject. So time is also a thief of youth. It's a metaphor. It's comparing time to something else. And he has this implied metaphor stolen on his wing here, he doesn't say, oh, uh, time is a bird that flies away, but he's implying that it has wings, so therefore time is a winged creature. And then, of course, he talks about, I know I look young, but I'm really a grown man. And then at the end, he talks about God as his great taskmaster. It's kind of interesting. It's an allusion to the story of the talents in Matthew 20, 1 through 16. The taskmaster is somebody who's in charge of a group of workers, it's interesting that he would use this word because when you talk about taskmaster, its connotation is not a positive one. It's watchful, judging, a slave driver. So it's very puritanical, that idea that God is really powerful and judgmental and harsh, and I want to serve him, even though he's making it sound like, um, you know, like God will forgive me, God's patient, but God is the great taskmaster. It's just an interesting use of the word there. Okay, so another poem he did later on, so that one was in early in his career, and now on his blindness later on when he had gone blind from writing so much. Again, the format is an Italian sonnet. In the octave, again, he's saying, I wanted to do great things for God, but now here I am, I'm old, spent, and blind. So again, he's bemoaning a similar topic and on, and on his blindness. It says, when I consider how my light is spent, ere half my days in this dark world and wide, and that one talent which is death to hide, lodged with me useless, though my soul more bent to serve therewith my mass maker and present my true account, lest he returning chide. Doth God exact day labor, light denied, I fondly ask? But patience to prevent that murmur soon replies. God doth not need either man's work or his own gifts. Who best bear his mild yoke, they serve him best. His state is kingly, thousands at his bidding speed, and post or land and ocean without rest. They also serve who only stand and wait. Very famous line at the end. So at the end, the volta comes, but patience. And it's interesting because but 
is in the middle of the eighth line. Usually it'll happen at the beginning of this, the um, sestet, but here it's at the very end of the octave. octave. And the sestet is basically saying, after but patience, God, is, God does not need mere humans to do his work. He just requires Milton to be patient and willing. You know, those, they also serve who only stand and wait. Very famous um, quote there. Okay, so some important points to cover here. So he says, when I consider how my light is spent, he's talking about um, how his light, his ability to see is lost and from um, writing in a dark prison. He says, air half my days in this dark world and wide. He's inverting the word order. Normally someone would say dark and wide worlds, but he you know, turns it around and says dark world and wide, emphasizing that characteristic by putting it at the end. That's a strong um, trait of Milton's writing. He likes to invert word order. When he talks about the talents, that's an allusion to the parable of the talents from Matthew 25, 14 through 30. And the lesson learned in that parable is that you need to use the gifts that you're given. Don't just hide them. And he says, I fondly ask. When he says fondly, the archa archaic meaning of the word fondly is foolishly. That's what it meant then. So even though this is all written in English and we can read it, it doesn't have to be in translation, there are still some words that had different meaning then than we have now. Words change their meaning very often. And patience, he's personifying the, the idea of patience, right, by making it a person that can actually talk to him. And when he talks about mild yoke, that's an oxymoron. A yoke is something that is hard and forces you to work, and mild means it is gentle and easy. So an oxymoron is something that the two words don't seem to really go together. They seem to contrast each other. Mild yoke. So what he's really saying is even though you know, you're putting this yoke on me and you want me to work, God isn't going to ask me to do anything more than I'm able to do. He's going to give me the strength I need. So that's what he's saying when he says mild yoke. Yes, he requires work, but he's not going to require anything more than what I'm able to do. So he's not going to be saying, Milton, you're blind. Why didn't you do thus and so? He's going to say, okay, Milton, I've given you all these other abilities. I want you to write these epics. I want you to speak these. I don't want you to, you know, go out and do all these great other things that you think you ought to be doing. This is what I want you to be doing. And I'm going to give you the strength and the ability to do what you have to do. So that's what Milton is saying in this poem. I really like it. Thanks. Bye.